The following program is available in high definition on channel 700. This program is designed and produced by the community with the support of TV Kojiko. Welcome to Oakville Matters. Oakville Matters is a community television show that helps us eliminate, illuminate the, the things that matter to Oakville. And one of those is food security. There are many residents of Oakville uh, that you wouldn't, you'd be surprised to know about who, uh, who need food security. And luckily for all of us in Oakville, there's apparently no shortage of groups working hard at that. Here today to help us uh, talk about this topic are uh, uh, Michael McCulloch, uh, I hope I passed, and uh, Brenda Haidu, and uh, Chris Burr. And I betray my Anglo-Saxon roots by having less trouble with your name than with the, the uh, more Eastern European names, and I apologize for that. Um, uh, Michael, you're the Community Food Network Manager for Halton Food Council, and, and you support and promote local food production. In fact, I have a picture that I wonder, James, if you'd like to show right now, uh, or maybe, maybe there you go, Michael. You recognize this? Yeah, that's so. That's our community garden at Margaret and Maurice. Um, it's a uh, it's uh, a housing uh, complex run by Halton Region, and we've partnered up with actually a number of different organizations, including Art House uh, and Oakville Art Galleries, in order to uh, create a really unique community garden program called Art in the Garden that uh, combines uh, sort of creativity uh, in terms of um, sort of artistic uh, artistic. Uh, pursuits and training and whatnot with uh, gardening and so we engage um, engage kids they're anywhere from general I guess our youngest were probably we had some three-year-olds toddling about to you know 15 and 16 year olds who go in for a drop-in session and learn how to garden. So I hope the vegetables were artistic as a result. <laughs> well you, you can see they like to paint the boxes and we made the signs with them and we did things like making a zine um, with them so the kids got to sort of reflect on their own activities and sort of express some of their concerns and some of their issues and so things that matter to them um, while they're doing that. So Brenda you're the executive director of Food for Life. Mm -hmm. and why don't you uh, tell the viewers what you do, what your group does? So Food for Life is a registered charity and we're in the food bank sector. So hunger relief is, is the core of what we focus on. And what we do, um, we were launched 20 years ago um, on the basis of diverting food that was destined for landfills and providing that to people in need. And today that has evolved into um, an infrastructure where we have a fleet of refrigerated vehicles where we now source surplus food. It could be um, uh, food that is would otherwise be destined for the landfill, but it could be food fresh off the farm. Um, and uh, out of the doors of wholesalers and retailers. And we provide that food to about 80 different hunger relief agencies and food banks in the region. Uh, currently, through the program supported, we are providing food for almost 30,000 client visits per month. And the food that we provide is uh, to the equivalent of 175,000 meals per month. Right. Mm -hmm. And Chris, um, your group has a kind of a niche. Why don't you? Uh, share that. Sure, no problem. So uh, so our organization is a charity as well and we uh, partner with schools to run uh, healthy eating programs or student nutrition programs in the school systems. Uh, both school boards, uh, both high school and, uh, and elementary school um, with the idea that we're feeding breakfast, snacks uh, and lunches um, to uh, students with no stigma attached, so anyone uh, can access these as needed, because uh, stigma is an issue that we run into with people in need. Um, so we are uh, currently in 110 schools across Halton, um, feeding about 25,000 kids a week healthy food. Uh, so at least once a day, we know that these kids have access and are and are able to eat a healthy meal. Uh, and uh, we've still got some schools to partner with, but uh, overall, last year we fed uh, three million meals to kids across Halton. So you know, this, um, the spectrum that you guys just, that you represent and that you've just painted uh, illustrates that some of this um, food security revolves around people who are in need. 
uh, perhaps for economic reasons, but then there's clearly others who are in need of better diet because they've just made bad choices. They you know, skipped breakfast or whatever, or, or didn't, or forgot to bring lunch or, or whatever, and thinking in terms of the range that you serve in the schools. Um, and, and Brenda, I, you were, when you were describing your, your group, you reminded me of headlines I've seen where in France they're talking about mm -hmm. uh, uh, not allowing restaurants to throw food away and mm -hmm. other concepts like that. Are we headed in that direction too? Well, we hope that we are and um, and there is there is a lot of food waste and there's a lot of hunger um, as well and we can easily bridge the gap with um, eliminating food waste and working with the uh, food security sector to make sure that those in need actually can benefit from healthy food and um, and Food for Life really focuses on three in three core categories and that's providing produce protein, meat, and dairy. And these tend to be the most expensive items in the grocery stores, but also seem to be um, the items that are typically disposed of uh, from uh, retailers, wholesalers. So um, we, in Halton, and, and however big your region served mm -hmm. is, we're not, uh, we're not chasing the restaurants yet. Well, restaurants are um, are very generous as well. Our core is with the wholesalers and the retailers yeah. and the farming community. Uh, we think that that's that is uh, our, our best opportunity. And then food safety comes into play as well. So yeah. we need to make sure that the quality of the food is of of um, uh, is of the same quality that I would serve my own family tonight at the dinner table. Oh yeah, the most intriguing part mm -hmm. are, uh, of this restaurant angle is how do you deal with the safety factor? Mm -hmm. uh, so. Mm -hmm. I, I watch the French with some bemusement. They must know something I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so how, how great is the need uh, across the region of Halton and more specifically where, where uh, in Oakville? Uh, Mike? Um, there's a lot of numbers that are sort of thrown around and it's very difficult because uh, with something like food security you know we're we're an affluent uh, we're an affluent region and a lot of the need uh, is hidden and food is one of those things that I think a lot of families um, you know people who are working hard and we've all you know we've all struggled with, with eight dollar cauliflower and the sort of rising food prices they're projected to rise another five percent again this year I struggle with cauliflower at any price <laughs> <laughs> Nice cheese sauce. Yeah. Place. Well, I stopped cooking with cheese. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to get my last child to leave home. <laughs> what's, uh, what's your sense of the need in our community, Chris? Um, well, and, and you, I think you said it well, is the, uh, there's certainly the financial need, but we talk about time poverty a lot in this area on people that commute in. Um, and I was walking through a school the other day and saw a young gentleman uh, pulling out of his locker a bag of chips and a Coke, and the uh, teacher said, that's, I guarantee you that's his lunch for the day because he's responsible for feeding himself. So as, as well as the financial need, we certainly do run into that. People not eating well, people eating too much fast food, uh, the time constraints around trying to sit down and cook a meal it's it's not easy in the environment we live in in the in the commuter town so uh, there's different needs that are out there um, I'm, I'm never going to admit that I ever resembled that student <laughs> with the <laughs> chips and the coke for lunch but Brenda uh, I, maybe I'll give away more than I should when I say how do we uh, educate people like me and him uh, and mm -hmm. others who might use candy for lunch I mean wh where does that go well, just going back to um, to the previous um, uh, point about hunger, and hunger isn't necessarily what people may think. So a lot of people think that people living in poverty, those living in poverty, are struggling with income, when in fact that 20% of the clients that we serve are seniors. So seniors who are on fixed incomes um, in the winter especially have to make a decision between paying their heat bill and buying groceries. So that's that's a demographic of great need. Um, also new Canadians, um, we're finding that um, uh, a lot of homes with new Canadians have multiple families living under one roof. So the home may look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside there's a family with multiple people struggling to put food on their tables. Um, and then there's also the working poor, the precarious class. These are individuals who are uh, gainfully employed, um, earning, you know, um, at or near minimum wage, working two or three jobs, just trying to make ends meet. And um, and there's a stigma around accessing food as well. If, if you don't mind, I'll just tell a little story um, about a phone call that I received a couple months ago. And it was from a woman. She was terribly embarrassed. And listen, I'm so sorry I'm calling. I'm a single mom. I have two daughters. And um, I'm having a really tough month. Can you help me? Um, I don't have any food. And I sent my children 
children to school today without lunch. Thankfully, programs like Health and Food for Thought are there for that sort of situation. I referred this woman to a local food program and she called me a couple of hours later from the parking lot and said, listen, I can't go in. I don't belong here and I can't wait in line for food. This is not me. And she drove off. Luckily, we were able to enroll her in another program and she was all set. But that just goes to show the stigma and the type of hunger that is out there. So it's not typical. Yeah. Well, you know, it's, it's the precarious, as mayor, one of the things I've learned I, before I was mayor, I think I was um, rather insulated from a lot that goes on. And maybe the average person is fairly insulated as well. Um, it really came home to me uh, how precarious uh, everyone's life can be when uh, I met a woman whose husband, uh, uh, I don't know, his, the sense of responsibility and engagement that he, that, they, that he had contributed to their marriage suddenly went away and uh, she and teenage kids were left high and dry on their own and, um, and she had been in the homemaker mode that you know I don't think there's anything wrong with uh, you know there's there's a commitment to the home and the family that's important in society and all of a sudden here she was uh, you know mm -hmm. in a state of terror really because yeah. everything was running out nothing had come through and she needed access to food and to other help as well and uh, the uh, and that can happen to, to anybody I imagine I don't want to pick on men I suppose it could uh, you know, the wife could similarly do, I suppose, although I have to say, guys, I haven't heard of any women doing that, so uh, <laughs> it may be on us, uh, but uh, the, uh, um, I, I gather from the statistics that you started with that um, you must be reaching and able to reach everybody that, that needs, because those were huge numbers. We're not reaching everybody. I mean, those we're, were not. Those were bigger I, numbers I, than anybody. I mean, 25,000 kids. Uh, what did you say? 85,000. So, uh, so we're serving uh, just just shy of 30,000 client visits a month in Halton region. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. but I think you did talk about a good point around the education side mm -hmm. because I think that's something that we all wish we could try and do more. Uh, take it beyond just feeding and trying mm -hmm. to educate. And I heard an educator talking the other day about the elimination of the home ec program years ago, and said that that mm -hmm. was probably one. And it was called something after that. I'm showing my age, I'm sure, but um, but that whole educating kids around healthy eating and food and budgeting and it just doesn't exist and it does in pockets but not every child has to take something around learning how to eat healthy and learning how to cook a meal and learning how to budget for food because they know that there's a fast food restaurant around the corner well you know I, I I'm with you I, I don't if you're saying they shouldn't have got rid of it I agree with you I'm one of those when I, when I was in school my mom forced me to take home ec. that was so embarrassing I, I took so much trouble from the other guys whose moms weren't that cruel but my mother had this be in her bonnet. I said, no son of mine is going to be a burden on a woman. <laughs> you're going to know how to iron a shirt. You're going to know how to cook a meal. You're going to know how to clean up. And I went, Mom. <laughs> well, and eventually they did change that. What, you're right, Dave. When I went, you either took shop or home ec, and eventually it evolved into a, uh, a course where all of yeah, males let me, and let me be clear, I was them, forced so. to take both. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's right. Yeah. And, and food literacy is very important. Mm -hmm. um, so there are a number of different programs out there that uh, that teach people on how to pre prepare and store food. There are community kitchens in particular, and there's some good work coming uh, through the uh, Halton Food Council as well. But food literacy is, is very important. So it's not only, you know, what to do once you have the food, whether, you know, you're, um, you're in need or you've collected that food from a uh, hunger relief agency. It's how to store and preserve it so to ensure it has the longest life possible. And we're going to be working on a program with the Halton Poverty Roundtable, Feeding Halton, and the Food Council on, uh, on food waste and how to educate the public around that. So, so we're actually making Eat Your Greens television right now yeah. with a side dish of take care of them as well. Is, yeah. is that what we're doing here? Yeah, well, yeah. And, and I mean, you have to change those relations. I mean, one of the things that I found the most fulfilling with, because um, I mean, let's be honest, a lot of people are really disconnected from the food they eat. They're, you know, we're used to getting packaged convenience foods and sort of at best throwing them together. And not only is that expensive, um, it's bad for your health, it's bad for the environment, um, and, and a 
lot of kids, I mean, these are crucial life skills um, to, to learn how to cook, to learn how to prepare foods, and to know where they come from. And when I work with the children in the community garden, I mean, one of the things that I was always surprised at was how willing they were to try new things when they grew them. So kids who would pick up a carrot or a pea or a beet and say, I don't, not only do I not know what this is, I had never even thought about eating this, and without hesitation, throwing a dirty, like, you know, beet that they just plucked out of the ground into their mouths and being, and saying, yum. <laughs> and, and, and it changing that fundamental relationship. You're supposed to brush it off. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, 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 but that willingness and that eagerness when you change the terms of the experience so that it's not, so you don't see it as a chore, as a burden, that you can celebrate that whole process and, and learn the flavors associated with it and the skills associated with it. So, uh, you know, I, I, I get it. I think you do have to meet the need, but you also have to supply the awareness of, of what you need. Mm -hmm. um, and it struck me, you, you, your, your conversation reminded me, I know a restaurateur, I find this ironic or contradictory in a good way. She, uh, she started a program around the concept of return to table. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and uh, her, so here she is, a restaurateur whose self-interest is you ought to come to her restaurant and she'll make the meal. And she's putting all her spare energy into, into saying, and you should learn to cook and you should have a family dinner mm -hmm. around the table and everybody come back to family dinner. Okay. I find that, uh, you know, both praiseworthy and, uh, and remarkable. But you know, when you consider the source, it's really interesting because uh, it comes out of left. I wasn't expecting it from a restaurant tour. Uh, and you forget that social aspect of mm -hmm. gathering around a meal that people don't do as much anymore. And, and the, the fantastic thing is we can see that in a school system when you've got a, a breakfast at T.A. Blakelock, which is right in the heart of Oakville, feeding 250 kids every morning with music playing, the teachers in there, communicating with the kids. Um, because a lot of them don't actually sit down and have a meal. They're eating on the run. So using entertainment, you attract them in and expose them to good eating? Because I know that in your it. basket <laughs> and your materials <laughs> that you're, you're not handing out chips and Coke. That's correct, yeah. Yeah, we find the same thing. So food brings people together. And uh, when it comes to those who are struggling putting food on their table, um, those individuals will show up for food first. And food can transform pretty much most other aspects of poverty. So it's a very interesting point. And so some of the things that we're looking at at Food for Life and our agency and outreach program partners is once we have um, them engaged for food, how else can we transition them into other services to help them move out of poverty? but they will mostly come for food initially. So mm -hmm. you do, or you have opportunities, I suppose, to refer people to well, organizations like KSM, for example. Mm -hmm, absolutely. And we want to do that better. And uh, the food sector, the food and security sector, um, the hunger relief um, agencies in particular have come together recently to say, listen, we need to do a better job at this. And so we're going to have a good hard look at how to uh, collaborate a little bit better to ensure that, um, that those in need are at the forefront. Well, I think everybody, um, once they realize the need, appreciate what you're doing. Uh, do you have room for volunteers in your organizations or are you overwhelmed with people trying to help already? I'd love to say we're overwhelmed, so yeah. Um, we have about 1,400 volunteers across Halton, which is fantastic, and they come from students, teachers, parents, grandparents, you name it, corporations, um, and we probably could use a thousand more uh, a thousand because more. you've got to have as I said, there's 50 sites that we're not even in yet in schools, um, and preparing food for that many kids requires uh, requires a lot of hands so we're always looking for people uh, to uh, to continue to help us out and I'm sure everyone would, would agree with us. So, so room for volunteers with you. Brenda, how about you? Yes, volunteers are the lifeblood of our organization so we have about 800 volunteers that help us deploy our food programs in the community and we know that we need to do more so absolutely we need more volunteers in community but also in our warehouse sorting through some of the food. So how do people reach you? They can go to foodforlife.ca and uh, connect through us via the website and we'll be happy to look at how that we can engage them and individuals and corporate teams as well. It's a great uh, corporate uh, um, day to have in our warehouse uh, working to, to help your fellow neighbor. 
Michael, do you have room for volunteers in your group? Yeah, I mean, we're largely a volunteer-run organization, so we're always looking, and, and our, our mandate is a little bit different than uh, both Chris's uh, and, Bre and Brenda's in the sense that we're trying to look at um, how to connect that sort of big picture and, and the small, and we have all sorts of different programs uh, that, we're, uh, you know, that we're looking at and kind of collaborative efforts that we're trying to push forward, so we're always looking for volunteers. And, and, and how do people reach you? Uh, same thing, website, uh, just the Halton Food Council CA and we have some contact information there a little bit of information on some of the initiatives that we have and 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 ways of volunteering we have a you know pretty active board um, and and we're always looking for 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 new blood basically to sort of help because um, food is everybody eats it's that common connector and, and yet, you just want them to eat better <laughs> well yeah and and to think about this you know how that food got to them the kind of, you know, how it was produced, who produced it, how far it traveled. That story of food that we've become disconnected from is a way into a lot of, whether it's issues of poverty or environmental degradation or the future of farming in the, in, in the region. Uh, you know, we're, we're facing, uh, I mean, when you talk about food security, we often think about, uh, you know, getting that next meal. But what about who's going to produce that meal? Um, you know, in, in Halton, the average age of a farmer is 60. Um, we're, we're coming, you know, the developers are really sort of putting a premium on the land and it's going to become harder and harder for that next generation of farmers to even engage in that food system. So we might demand local food all we want, but there's going to be no means to grow it locally. We, we find that a lot of the farms have already been bought by developers and then they're yeah. being rented back for yep. farming that's uh, only, uh, I guess, temporary. and and you, you see a tendency of people to hope that their final crop will be houses. Yeah. And so uh, your organization may find it helpful to be involved this year in the region's review of its official plan because mm -hmm. the region of Halton really is the level of the municipal planning structure that, that speaks to the future of farming. Okay. Yeah. Um, are you already uh, hip to that or what's Yes, happening? yeah, quite a bit. So we um, uh, we have the agricultural liaison officer for the Halton region, Anna DeMarshi Myers, sits on, she sits on our on our board. She's a non-voting member. Um, we have, we work with the region quite closely on a lot of initiatives. We have connections to the health department, to Halton Community Housing. Um, we've worked with health promotion, uh, people within the region to get into the school system to, to, again, to sort of explore that food system and see how we can engage students in this larger question. So we actually work quite, quite, uh, quite a bit with the region and are looking at ways of leveraging resources. Uh, right now, I'm really excited about this food security event that we're putting together. That we're working with all sorts of partners within the community to look at you know, how how can we collaborate? Because at, at this stage, everybody is 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 looking for the same at the same pot of money essentially. And there's so much good work that's being done out there um, that we want to make sure that that work. Is is being done in the most efficient ways possible. How do you get funded? So we're funded by Trillium, so we have a three-year Trillium fund, and we're looking at all, and, and right now, so we're, we're, we're actually just finishing up year two, and we've, um, and, and... So you have renewal anxiety going through <laughs> the organization. Very much so, very much so. Um, we were lucky recently to receive a grant from the Burlington Community Foundation, along with Food for Life and Feeding Halton, and the Halton Poverty Roundtable that's looking at food waste, and we're actually looking, we're looking at creative solutions as well, like social enterprise and urban agriculture. And, and ways of actually generating revenue by selling food um, and, and using that as a way of transforming our cities, especially a city like Oakville, doesn't really have that much farmland left. But there's plenty of space in urban areas, and I think some of the most exciting things that are happening in agriculture right now are, are some of the innovations that are happening in, in, in urban agriculture and, and producing food within city limits because it offers that opportunity to engage citizens in that process. Canada is an extremely urbanized country. Something like 80% of us live in urban areas, and only about 2% of us are farming. So we have to find a creative way to reconnect people. Yeah, we make community garden space available across Oakville, but I would be surprised if we hit 2% using it. Yeah, and, and, and honestly, and a lot of these, or, you know, community gardens are great. I love them, um, but, you know, after, it, 
what I've seen a lot of time is people get engaged in them. You have a couple of years where they're running really, really well, and then you get volunteer fatigue, and the, they start sort of being taken over by weeds. So we have to find a way to, um, because these spa these spaces can be incredibly productive. Now, the ones I'm thinking of are actually people are running their own little garden plot, yep. producing their very own vegetables. Yes. Um, Brenda, how is your group funded? So we have um, a few different uh, revenue funding streams. Um, the Halton Region is um, is a funder of ours. Uh, United Way is um, is a funder of ours. We have a number of private foundations, family foundations. Sprott Foundation has been very gracious. Um, and then we also rely on um, Oakville Community Foundation, Burlington Community Foundation, and then the, the general public. Um, the public donation is very, very important to us. It really helps us to bridge the gap between what can be provided uh, financially through uh, corporations and organizations. The pre-packed bags in the grocery stores, are, do they go to you? Those, that's an excellent program. Those bags, those are non-perishable bags and they go directly to the food banks that we serve. So what we do is we complement that non-perishable product with the fresh product. Okay. Mm -hmm. And Chris, what, what about you? How, do you? how does your organization keep going? So we get about half of our funding from the Ontario government, Ministry of Children and Youth Services. So all across Ontario, the, uh, uh, the government gives about $30 million to student nutrition programs. Uh, they call it seed money every year, um, and then it's up to us to uh, to fund the gap between what they give us and what the programs cost. So, so they expect you to grow the food? So we, <laughs> probably that's one of the expectations. So, so again, we use uh, obviously local United Way agencies. We're lucky enough to have a Trillium grant as well right now. Uh, corporate donors, individuals, um, we cobble together the rest of it as best we can because they want the community involved with feeding their kids. So the Trillium grant, I, I hope everybody in viewing land knows that Trillium is a foundation that, that dispenses a sliver of the profits from gambling in Ontario. Uh, and I guess that justifies gambling and or <laughs> redeems it in some way. Uh, uh, I, I once uh, didn't speak uh, positively about it and I never heard the end of it, so <laughs> I'm, I'm not speaking negatively at There's all about it. definitely positive benefits, yeah. yes. Um, so what's, uh, what's the next big thing, is there a next big thing in your group, Chris? Uh, the next big thing is working together. And maybe in 25 words or less. Sure. Working together across Ontario better with other agencies and working together more federally across Canada to feed kids in school. Oh boy, um, big ambitions. So Brenda, what about, what about yeah. you? What, in 25 words or less, what's the next big thing? Collaboration and partnership with our fellow uh, not-for-profit hunger relief agencies to make sure that um, the stigma is reduced and everyone has access to food with dignity. And the next big thing for you, Mike? urban agriculture, so figuring out ways to, to, to really sort of um, get cities growing more of their food and engaging engaging citizens in, in really creative ways and transforming kind of community gardens into um, more productive spaces. Well, I want to thank each of you for sharing your activities and your thoughts today uh, with me and with everyone watching. I hope you will tune in again when we discuss uh, what matters to Oakville. Uh, and based on what I heard here today, seems to me we might look forward to, I don't know, gardens on the rooftops, uh, uh, maybe instead of solar panels, or with solar panels over top of that. Uh, the, the sexiest thing in architecture right now is what to do with roof space, apparently. Uh, thanks very much for tuning in, and I hope you now understand Oakville Matters.